Welcome to another episode of Create or Die. This is your host, Ike Allred. Now, I told you it was coming, and today is the day. I'm pleased to announce that uh, we have our inaugural debut guest here on the program, my main man, Mr. Trevor Williams. Trevor is an animator slash motion designer with years and years of experience and a passion for all things motion. I've had the pleasure of collaborating with Trevor on dozens of projects over the past five years, and I'm constantly impressed with his ability to take my style tiles and storyboards and breathe life into them with his wicked After Effects skills, those super sexy, buttery smooth animation skills that Trevor brings to the table. (laughs) So I hope you enjoy this conversation about animation, creative burnout, dealing with imposter syndrome, and how one can become slash remain a valued asset of any team. Let's get this party started. Enjoy. Trevor, <laughs> welcome, my friend. How you doing? Excellent. Hey, first off, completely humbled and, and grateful that you invited me to come on and, and to speak a little. So thank you for that. And uh, yeah, things are good. Happy to, uh, to be here. Awesome. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you're coming to us from, uh, from far away, across the pond, as it were. Is that right? Don't, yeah, don't let, don't, let my, don't let my accent fool you. <laughs> I uh, currently reside in England, in Oxford, and, uh, but I, I am American. I'm here right now helping my wife, uh, who's getting her PhD at Oxford, of all places. So cool. And yeah, supporting her through that with our with our kids. So we're having quite an adventure. We've been here a year. Yep. Best husband of the year award for sure. Um congrats to you, Trevor. You're the man. And and uh, I'm glad that we've been able to continue to work together despite the distance. And oh, I'm more I'm more grateful for that than than you are, believe me. Well, it's it's uh it's mutual for sure. But uh you know, we've known each other for going on five years. Yeah. Um, Holy cow. Has it been five? Can you believe it? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> it. It, it doesn't feel like that, but, uh, but it also feels like, it's, like we've known each other we, forever. Yeah. Local, like we have finishing each other's sentences. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. No, uh, our creative relationship I think is pretty strong and, uh, and yeah, I, I would, I would take a bullet for you, my friend. That's, that's, how, that's how strong it's gotten. Awesome. Well, how, it's be, how strong it's become. <laughs> Likewise, for sure. I would take for you uh, a, a joust. I don't know. <laughs> awesome. Well, great. And, and in that five years, you know, I've, I've picked up bits and pieces about your past. And, and one question I, I don't think I ever have asked you specifically. So now, better time than ever is, uh, you know, how did you end up going into animation? Yeah, um, we're going to go all the way back to when I was, I was a child before I even entered school. <laughs> nice. um, my father is a screenwriter, documentarian, filmmaker. And so I grew up with my father kind of already kind of doing filmmaking and production and screenwriting and and even animation. And um, he mostly focused, of course, with the camera and, mm-hmm. and actual celluloid film and everything. And so when I was little, my father would take me to his, uh, at the time while he was like finishing his degree, his film degree at the University of Utah and some other places. He, he attended a few universities, but uh, at this time he was finishing a specific degree at Utah. And we were, he'd bring me in um, because if I wasn't at a babysitter's house, he'd bring me into his kind of department, uh, filmmaking department. And I would see these posters of Frankenstein and the blob. And, and he'd, he'd be in there starting to edit and do his stuff on these um, very vintage old editing machines with the full on uh, where you take the reel of film and you lay it down on these discs on, this, on these tables. Yeah. Yeah. And you'd feed them through different cogs and cut and splice the film and tape it together. And that's how you would edit. And you'd have the two screens yeah. uh, similar to like how 
Adobe Premiere Pro and other things kind of work when you're editing. But this is the old school. This is the traditional way. And he'd, he'd go nuts. And so he'd be sitting there editing his documentaries together that way. I can picture put, toddler Trevor on the floor wrapped yeah. up in celluloid. Yeah. There was, there was plenty of times he'd say, you have to be absolutely silent because he'd be recording with a microphone and he'd be doing the audio and the sound effects and everything else. But for a lot of those times, because I was so young and, you know, my attention span and my curiosity and my, my just energy would go everywhere. He'd basically go into this viewing room. They had a viewing room uh, with all these viewing booths and he'd sit me down and he'd pull out a movie and he'd put a movie on. So a lot of the times it was like cartoons for me, but sometimes it was like creature from the black lagoon or it was, um, yeah, and it was these classic horror movies. Even though I was a kid, I loved them. And I grew up on watching The Munsters and Gilligan's Island and all these films. I was I was a child of the 80s, a product of the 80s, coming up on almost 40 here. That lets you know how old I'm getting. Um, not quite there yet, but still soon. a few years behind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, so... So we'd watch a lot of these vintage things on like Nick at Night and everything else, and it was fun. Um, so that's kind of where I started, and watching my dad get into this creative field and stuff. And then he built this animation table, full-on light table, with where you could put the papers down on the co- like on the pegs, yeah. and with a camera set up above that he could change the the depth and the angle and the and the focus, and we could actually take frame by frame animation on this light table and and it was so funny because that's where that's where i started my dad said okay he brought i have two older brothers and he brought us together and he says you know kind of like a family meeting okay i built this table we're going to do this stuff and it's going to be fun and you kids can make animation if you want and and he's (laughs) like so you and i'm like okay how do i do that and he said just draw on a piece of paper and then i take a picture of it and i said okay so my brothers kind of explained to me, okay, yeah, let's do it. You know, they, they, they were like doing flip books at the stage and I was still mm-hmm. too young to even do anything. And long story short, I thought, okay, I'll draw all these arrows and these arrows are going to do this art. You know, like I'm going to see all these arrows going like in a battlefield. Yeah. And I draw uh, like seven arrows on a paper and I give it to my dad and I said, okay, there you go. And, he, <laughs> and, and I want to see this animate, you know? Because <laughs> I had this complete different conception of it's gonna work. It's gonna... Right. <laughs> He's like, "Okay, hey, now draw like a thousand more." <laughs> I'm sitting here going, "What?" So that sounds yeah. like a lot of work, Dad. Come on. Yeah, I kind of dropped it after that really fast. <laughs> but he still, to this day, he still has that animation table and some other things. It's yeah, it's pretty awesome. But um, fast forward, I, I followed kind of in footsteps of my brothers. They were very artistic. They drew, did a lot of drawings. And so I started doing a lot of drawings, but I got really upset with myself a lot because I compare my drawings to their drawings. Mm -hmm. And of course they're older than me, more experienced and, and everything. And, but my brother one day, this was a pinnacle moment. I'm ripping up my drawing and he stops me. He's like, why are you doing that? And I said, cause it's just not as good as yours. And he said, hold on a second. And he, pull, he's, he uncrumples it and puts it down. He says, he had a portfolio of his old work. Yeah. And he says, how old are you? And, you know, I'm like, I'm obviously four years younger than you, you know. Yeah. And, and he says, yeah, you're, you're, I think I was probably 10 at the time or, so, or uh, 12, to, somewhere in there, 11 to 10, 11. And, yeah. he, and, he's, and he says, um, he stops me and says, look, here's your art at 10. And now he pulls out this folder and he shows me his art at 10. Mm-hmm. And, and then he says, look at where you are compared to me at 10. And it blew my mind because I was better. To, like in my mind, I judged my art better <laughs> than his art. Well, at yeah. Ten, yeah. At 10. I was like, wait a second. I'm totally better than you at 10. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Nice brother. And, yeah. yeah. And he says, exactly. He says, you have the potential to go far. So he said, keep it up. Don't get discouraged. And, and he's like, any time. And then he gave me this eraser. Like it was actually, I kind of always borrowed his eraser because it was this better eraser. Yeah. And, 
he drew his signature on this eraser and he says, anytime you feel down about your art, look at this eraser and remember that you, your art right now is better than my art at the same age and just keep going. And mm -hmm. I ended up, I ended up keeping that eraser more as like a memento for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I did use it, but eventually, you know, for a long time I didn't use it just because I wanted to kind of remember sure. that. Special. So fast forward, um, now I'm like in high school, really into art. I become the student body artist, and that was really challenging and fun in its own self. And I um, got to do posters and T-shirts, and I even had to like decorate school dances and <laughs> and do calendars and do all this stuff. And it ended up being more of a challenge than I anticipated, but it helped me um, really get my my legs under me as far as having to create for a client and having yeah. to um having to kind of design on demand and at first i didn't like it at all and it was really <laughs> rough but and i like didn't even get a summer break that year because the artist had to do all this work over the most of the work they had to do was over the summer oh, to, prepare, to prepare for like homecoming and the start of the year to get the new year book signing up for yeah yeah so my like my whole summer was full of just constant daily grind and uh but it was rewarding and in the end i left this really cool mural that i painted in the school and a bunch of stuff like that and i i had this legacy that i enjoyed that i left yeah. um and i felt proud about it and then fast forward some more um i kind of get past a, a few things and i i i stopped create i stopped creating for a while okay. um and I finally start thinking, okay, now I need to figure out what I'm going to do for a living. And um, my mother was like, well, pharmacy is hot in demand right now. You should do pharmacy because <laughs> they'll pay you a lot. And, yeah. and I was like, oh, okay. And so I, and then my, my, that same brother that uh, I kind of followed in his footsteps he was finishing school and I kind of shadowed him for a while. And when I saw his, and he was graduating yeah. and, and I shadowed him for like a week, went to his classes and I got really discouraged because I thought, Oh no, like what he's going through right now. I don't know if I could, if I could do that. And it wasn't, I mean, I was, it wasn't like I was feeling bad for myself or anything. I just had a few scary doubts. Sure. about do I, do I really want to do this? Or, you know, I was kind of starting to see what am I going to do? And so I, you know, my mom was really trying to convince me. And, and so I kind of went down that path for a little while. And you know, when the, I started, uh, far, pharmaceutical path for a little while. Yeah. So when I started college, I went down the pharmaceutical path as far as a, a degree. Yeah. And I'm finishing most of my generals and I'm getting down to the last bit of my generals. And I have to do like an artistic credit. And I do this artistic credit and the art teacher just says, wow she sees like i'm bringing in my my homework bringing in my sketchbook and she's just like wow what's your major and i said pharmacy <laughs> <laughs> she dropped her jaw and she's like why and and i said uh because it's gonna pay me well <laughs> she's like do you know what else you could do you could do like this and this and this you could do graphic design whatever and i said okay well i said i don't know and then she's she realized that I was kind of on the cusp of maybe I want to change my major, right. but, but I wasn't quite ready to commit. So she brings in other creatives and uh, like other uh, teachers and directors and graphic design teachers and everything. And they come in and like she brought them in to convince me to change because um, they weren't there for, for chance. She kind of like invited, please come this yeah. day. This is the day he's going to be there. Having and, an intervention with this, uh, creator, yeah. he, he's, he's denying himself. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then, and then they look at my sketchbook and they are like thumbing through it and they're like, okay, okay. What's your major? <laughs> I would say pharmacy. And they'd say, what, why? And so, and then by that time, I started to say, I don't know why. And, uh, <laughs> and, and then I, I talked to my wife and I, I said, you know, I know I've gone down the road here a bit to do pharmacy, but I think I'm going to change careers. So I think I'm going to go into graphic design. 
and she at first was kind of like, well, if you're going to do it, you got to, you know, at least we haven't gone down too far that you can kind of change because I'd only like have missed a year of real like credits that, that probably would have mattered um, yeah. as far as, you know, so it's like either change now or don't and just, you know, finish the other. So I pulled the plug on pharmacy and went down uh, graphic design and I got very far. And then out of the blue, I had this last thing. I'm kind of in the upper division classes. I have this class called interactive design no. and, and animation. And it's, it was taught by this uh, teacher who came from Northern Ireland, um, worked at a couple of creative in- agencies and uh, was really cool. Anyways, he comes in and we sit down for this class that I had to beg him to get into because interactive uh, design and animation was actually at the time um, kind of like full and he was only taking like one or two added students. Yeah. So, and so I was like begging him, please, please add me, you know, cause I wasn't in this class and it turned out that uh, at the same time he became the director of the AIGA club okay. and and I was the president of the AIGA club. And so he, he, he's like, you know, I'll add you because I'm going to be talking to you a lot. <laughs> and so I think by technicality, he let me in the, in the class. Nice. <laughs> so it was kind of nice, but we sit down and on like the first day he shows this reel by this creative agency called brand new school. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's got this song by, by new order. Uh, <laughs> the song's just great. And then this reel is just amazing. And I, it was like an end, a choir of angels were telling me, this is your, this is your future. <laughs> and I watched this thing. And he, by the end of it, he says, everything you just saw, you can create with this tool right here on your laptop. And I sit here go, and my jaw dropped because I had always pictured my dad on these big machines on these <laughs> and thinking, and I remember watching him knowing, oh, if you were ever to go to going into like these animation industries and, and even visual effects, you kind of had to apprentice under these people that had these machines that cost like 30 or 50 grand. It's right. like you're never, you're never going to touch them unless you do it that way. When he shows me now it's possible with just your laptop and you can, and here's the software, you know? And I said, what? And so that was when all of a sudden everything changed and I would eat, sleep and breathe animation in this software. It was, it was both at the time I was doing both flash yeah. uh, when it was Adobe flash, but also after effects. Yeah. And I, and I lived in both and I just played with both and learned both and self-taught myself because in the end, um, that first year his class was semi okay. He was still getting his feet wet as far as he was a new teacher. The second year that, that if I had waited instead of tried to burst into his class, probably would have been better off sure. <laughs> to, to have done the second class. Cause the content, is, they're usually just one yeah. chapter ahead of you that first time around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but it didn't matter because I was literally going around the clock, learning what I could do on my own, playing with this stuff until I mastered it. And, and I, I, not that I mastered it. I keep learning new stuff all the time, things that I've never known. <laughs> um, there was even like an effect today that was called mini, mini max in yeah. after effects. Yeah. I had no idea what mini max was. And all of a sudden I see this and it like shrink wraps sometimes uh, an object that you already have. And it's better than masking and oh, wow. in, in many, in many ways. And I was thinking, I'm never getting the pen tool out again <laughs> and masking things. I'm going to use Minimax, you know? Anyways, um, so, so I keep learning things all the time. But, um, but yeah, that was the start of it. And then what happened was really in short succession after that, within a few months, I was getting to the point I needed to start really getting more jobs and find work. And there was a few of us that were... Um, kind of in this animation thing and our kind of the, the head or the dean of the school was getting um, pinged by people, agencies like, we're looking for talent to come in. Do you, have, do you have any suggestions from 
these students that are about to graduate. Yeah. And so he did, and he, he sent it to my friend. And my friend said, well, you know what? Actually, I'm already taking another job. Um, why don't you look at Trevor? And, and he's like, okay. And he's, and he's like, Trevor, why don't you go apply for this job? And I said, well, I don't even have anything ready. And he's like, it doesn't even matter. Just whatever you got, just throw it at him, see what happens. Like, what are you going to lose? Right. And, so, and so I do. And they call me up and they say, come in. And I do the interview and they gave me the job. That's great. And I was, yeah, I was floored. And, <laughs> and it was super fun, but I learned a lot. And it was also super rough. And, yeah. and, and of course, at entry, I was being paid beans. And, it, and I, deservedly so. I was young. And, sure. and uh, then, uh, then, you know, but they, and it was kind of a place, I'm not speaking ill of it, but kind of a place that, that chews you up and spits you out pretty fast. They, they kinda, I think they kind of look for fast, quick students that right. you know and, and and turn them around you know as yeah. as they grow but hey i got the it ended up being the best thing is when they when they fired me it was like i thought was the worst thing in my life but it ended up being the best thing in my life because now i had the tools and, and the experience. a lot and the experience yeah. and then and then everything after that was on the up and up and so that's where it's led me to today and now i just kind of um try to bring my sweet, sweet skills to lots of people, uh, try to do more freelance. I'm not, I'm not like a professional freelancer, but trying to, uh, eventually get there now that everybody else in the world <laughs> is doing the same thing <laughs> after the pandemic. Right. But, but yeah, lo and behold, here we are. Here we are indeed. Well, that's awesome. Thanks for, uh, walking me through that. Awesome. So as part of this, you were kind enough to, uh, brainstorm some some ideas some things that you thought that uh would be interesting discord between you and i and so appreciate that and the the first uh prompt if you will is around creative burnout and and how do we avoid that yeah i i've watched you um and i'll bring this up in that <laughs> sense of my question to you is I've watched you and you, and I, I too understand similar to like, I've listened to your other episodes and how I especially like, you know, the, the little story about the guy that wants to be successful and he finds somebody successful and they, and he puts him under the ocean <laughs> and struggle until he has to breathe. And he's like, you got to want it as much as you want to breathe. And, and I, I get that. And I have those kind of passions. I, and I am, and when I, I get in those flows, and I create like crazy, but I also, similar to like what this is all about, yeah. you can, and I, it's true. There's times, there's things I can never turn off and I'll just, like I said, eat, breathe, sleep, work on something around the clock. No problem. I will never burn out. I get that. But I'm also surprised at how well you do it when there is like, like there can be great creative burnout when you're working for an in-house or an agency yeah but you're also doing freelance on the side. And then you're also trying to create your own passion projects as well. Yeah. And I, and, and, and I do think you're one of the remarkable few. I wouldn't say that you're the, you're alone, but I would definitely say you're a remarkable few that can do that without just completely collapsing. I, you know, sometimes I feel like you're a robot, but right. <laughs> please share, share, share the secret sauce with us. Oh no. I appreciate that Trevor. And I, and uh, you know, I had to think about this a little bit, but uh, a couple of things that really helped me is the realization that I'm not going to get everything I want creatively out of work. And in the end it is a job. Um, and so having these, these creative outlets outside of work actually, I think, help keep me energized, remind me of, of you know, this is, this is why you got into this, you know, rather than hearing, you know, the stakeholder on a specific project at work telling you, oh, it's not right. And, and you're thinking, you're not creative. What, who do you think you are? <laughs> so, so that's part of it is having these creative outlets, I think, has helped me. And like I've talked about in previous episodes and we've talked about Trevor is uh, not being a specialist and, and having this self prescribed creative ADD, I think helps me jump around um, in my current role, you know, as a creative leader, there's a, a lot that I end up doing 
that isn't creative. So I find myself building up a, a desire to want to do more of that. Quite you know, you'll be writing an email to the team about some communication from higher ups <laughs> or going through Reich and, and looking at the different projects and following up on them. So that helps. You said in one of your last episodes that you, you got to schedule the time for it. Right. So are you scheduling in the morning, at night, the day before? I'm curious, like, are you just using your calendar app or are you using like your phone? What makes it easy to schedule? Because I need to be better. I, I, I sometimes write down a checklist or I use to do's uh -huh. and, and, and do that. But even then, as far as building a habit out of it, I haven't been perfect. So I, I'm wondering... Yeah. And there, there's no perfect answer for that. Sometimes it's a, a handwritten to-do list where it's like, yeah, these are the things that I have to get done after work today, or I'm going to explode because I haven't been able to have this creative outlet or whatever. And um, I, I kind of play it by ear, you know, being a family man like yourself and um, having a uh, a wife that, uh, you know, you never know when you get home what, what her day has been like or, or if she's been away and she comes home, whatever the scenario is, um, you know, you got to learn how to, and this is turning into a totally different subject here where <laughs> marital advice, uh, <laughs> but, but seriously, it's hard to schedule it. I might be thinking at work, yeah, I'm going to get home. I'm, I'm visualizing. I, I'm going to jump on the computer. I'm excited to do this. And then... Oh, it's been a rough day for my wife, my partner. How can I help her and give her a break? So in that case, I, I'll I'll just think, all right, I'll hang out with the family, and rather than going to bed at midnight, I'll go to bed at one or or two and have a couple extra Coca Colas in the morning or something to get me through. Um, or there's other times where I'll be thinking that, and and then it's like no. It's not coming to me right now. Yeah. I'm going to set the alarm for 30 minutes early, an hour early, and then get up and, and just start doing stuff. And, and, and we could kind of build up a whole episode around this, but I think um, sometimes it's just about making little, little progress on, on things. For me, sometimes a way to fight creative burnout is don't expect yourself to always be creative. Don't have too high of an expectation of ourselves because yeah, facing a blank page or finally having that time and thinking, okay, creativity happened now. Right. <laughs> doesn't no, always it's, it's, it's funny too. Like recently in my experience, I just did something for a client and you know, I, I said, I'll add some sound effects and, and they're like, okay, sounds cool. And then I did spend a bit of time doing that. And then in the end, they were just kind of like, you know what? Sound effects, I don't feel like are working. Let's just strip those out. And I started to think like, I should, I should be careful as to what I communicate and say, if they don't ask for it, maybe I shouldn't offer it because yeah. then, I can cut, then I can cut corners. And that was one thing I was thinking could help avoid creative burnout is right. not, not, not necessarily to diminish the quality of something, but... I do know the, the, the wise phrase like done is better than perfect. And often I feel like a lot of the creatives in the world like to be perfection. Like they're probably perfectionists at, at heart at what they do and what, yeah. you know, they want to put their stamp of approval on it and they don't want to ship it until they feel like it's of the quality of their standards. And it's, and that I'm, I'm so guilty of this in my own case where I want to, I want to, always hit this bar that I've raised for myself yeah. when in, when in truth, a lot of the time it's like, listen, buddy, that's not what they're asking for. Yeah. And not what you, not even what they're expecting. And if you can just, you know, if you could, you know, the, the bar may be, you know, feet, feet below what you're trying to do <laughs> and you could be done earlier and have less heartache and move on to more things and, and have less burnout. I think cutting corners and finding a way to just like be done versus perfect is, is, is key in my heart but yeah and, and i know that like setting a timer helps and i need to do more of the setting the timers i do it but i need to do it like religiously so um <laughs> but no do you have ways and methods of uh cutting corners yeah no that's a great question and it's something 
I don't think as a creative we'll we'll ever be able to completely get out of ourselves that battle for seeing the creative brief and sticking to it and just getting it out the door versus our ideas for you know how it could be better or this could really fill this hole in my in my reel or my portfolio if I can just nail it the way I envision it and then and then when the client or stakeholder or whatever says, no, that's, that's not right. Or, and then, yeah, that can be a kick in the creative crotch for sure. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) um, So yeah, I think overly communicating, you know, those quick cuts, understanding what it is they're asking for as quick as possible, because, you know, you and I have both experienced this a lot of times, they may say this is what they're asking for, but they, they're not able to really see it in their mind's eye. So if we can produce some stills or a wireframe or whatever that specific requester or client needs to, to say, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And then for things like sound effects, for example, you know, it's hard to get response on that without actually doing it, but rather than doing the full, you know, 60 seconds of, of the piece, maybe take a five second piece and say, Hey, I decided to try some sound effects in this part of it. Is this something you're interested in? Um, and you can get that quick, uh, yes or no. Or so anytime we can overly communicate that helps put it back on them. And I I think I may have talked about this in another episode, but it, it makes them feel more part of it like a collaborator as opposed to oh this creative is dictating this to me and i need to rationalize my job so i've got to give this person some feedback and we can help mitigate that a little bit i think if if we're getting those quick cuts to to people early one one last thing I'll, i want to say about creative burnout that yeah uh, i've been starting to do most recently so like i said i'm creeping up on 40 no. and and I feel like my body is, is starting to give out on me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it, I, I definitely don't feel as, as young and vibrant as I was at 20. So sure. um, one way I find that helps me, because sometimes if I'm sitting in front of a computer working, and there's great focus sometimes where no problem, nothing, I can't believe three hours have passed by or seven hours or eight hours, whatever. I notice that sometimes when it's on something I'm not entirely excited to work on and two or three hours rolled by, I'm starting to just be like a deer in the headlights. Yeah. But if I take like, if I say, okay, 40 to 40 minutes to an hour, I'm going to just focus on this task, let the timer go off. And then I, I, I actually physically stand up and I either stretch or I do squats or I do pushups or I do uh, curls. And I have like, I have, you know, some, some weights near my desk and, and, uh, that's resist- what I need to do is make time. Yeah. For- Nice. Yeah, that's and, cool. and all I all I do is 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 just get the blood flowing just a little bit, yep. and get my lungs working a little bit more, and then I'll sit back and the next hour of focus is so much more crisp than if I just tried to keep going. Yeah. So and I I mean I I stop for no more than like seven to ten minutes of just mm-hmm. just do a couple push ups, do a couple whatever. And sometimes it's three minutes, you know, but yeah. for, for, depending on if I'm, if I'm feeling really rushed on a deadline, but I've noticed how more effective I am. And uh, that's just to also, you know, bring focus so you're not so burnt out on a specific task even. Because mm-hmm. like, I feel like the, the creative burnout could be broad. It could be like, okay, are we going to completely be burnt out with animation in general or, yeah. or maybe just explainer videos or maybe just <laughs> cell animation or whatever it is, you know, and, and, and breaking up those tasks obviously help. I think that's something we we've, we've been trying to talk about as well, but physically getting the blood flowing has been my new thing. And similar to like how people go to the gym and say, Hey, today's leg day or yeah. today's today's arm day or whatever. I'm trying to separate. Okay. Monday is my biceps. Tuesday is my squats. You know, it's like, yeah. No, that's great. And I, I think uh, you reminded me of, of another point that I was trying to make in the beginning is that there are these other maybe not so creative tasks that you can transition to. If you're not feeling creative, um, jump to a, a different thing. Like if you're doing 3D, like 
if you've ever retopologized something, that doesn't feel creative at all. You've already done the, the sculpted model and you're just adding new cleaner geometry over top. Or if you're a web designer and you know, you've put together this pixel perfect design and you've got to go and do another one, well, maybe to help with burnout, jump to the part where you're saving out assets or if you're helping to build it, um, you're, you're using a different side of your, your brain for sure. So any of that repetitive stuff can be a good break. And then those are also things that maybe you can kind of do on autopilot and put on a podcast like this one and, yeah. uh, and listen to it uh, to help hopefully re rejuvenate that. They've been helping me. So. so super, super awesome and something that I'm sure many creatives are are struggling with all the time and, and let us know, you know, is this something you want to dig deeper in? Um, is there something you disagree with? We don't really have a commenting system, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask. We'll find a way. Any... Yeah. We need to figure that <laughs> Start once, getting some show notes. Inside <laughs> stuff, I think there'll be something, but awesome. So uh, next prompt, how to overcome dissatisfaction in your creative work slash imposter syndrome. So there's probably some, some overlaps here, but uh, what, what were you hoping to get out of this one? Yeah, so I think where some of my thoughts were on this is uh, sometimes, you know, I, I look back and, and I look at the body of work and, and I've been trying to be a champion of like, not necessarily changing a ton of styles or, or something at work because, you mm -hmm. know, most of my day is consumed in, you know, if, if you're working full time in house, you're working on one brand, you're working out for one company, you know, a lot of the stuff can start to feel the same and, and start to look the same and start to only be the same. And if you want to have a little bit more diversity in that, how can you possibly do that even in house at the same place where there might be that's so some of my question is prompted towards that because you being the head of creative. Um, I know a lot of the time you're obviously trying to keep uh, the brand and a lot of the projects to have, you know, consistency, but you're also the one that can kind of help be a decision maker with, uh, you know, the CEOs and, and other managers uh, above to kind of break the bounds and make something new and, and, and do some things. But um, also, imposter syndrome. So there's times where I've even been in lead roles, maybe even prematurely. It's crazy that in this world, I feel like, and this could be a whole nother discussion another time, but mm -hmm. I, I remember there's this meme I saw on like Twitter or Instagram and it had Boris Johnson <laughs> in front of like all these kids at, at school, but all these kids are they they put little titles on all the kids and one's like the creative director and the and art director this and producer yeah. this and whatever and Boris Johnson's just this regular designer animator you know yeah. and and sometimes me as I'm approaching 40 I can feel that way where all these younger kids or all these people are coming in and they're they're getting these roles I mean I've even had roles that I probably stepped into too early sure. and and, in, and at heart, I've learned, you know, it's better to just be a humble contributor that isn't out there to necessarily make it to the top as fast because I've noticed some dissatisfaction in some people that have. Or mm -hmm. I've also noticed some terror from people who kind of are in a role that I don't think they are, you know, they've bit off more than they can chew. But I know in this world, everybody's like, I got to, I got to race to the top this is you know it's a rat race so um but but with that said and with that meme and with those other things maybe there are people that are too like into these roles too early or maybe it's exactly what they need and mm -hmm. i'm sure there's a ton of people that could tell us their experiences and where they've been and how you know what their thoughts are on this and if it's or, yeah. if, or if they're just as upset it's not that i'm upset but it's like yeah, it, there, the, the system seems a little too crazy. We need to be less rewarding and, and, and giving to make someone a, a director at, you know, yeah. 19 <laughs> <laughs> versus maybe if they've had like 10 to 15 years in the industry or something like that, you know? Totally. Yeah, this is definitely something um, 
that I've experienced personally. And then as a, a leader of other creatives, you know, had countless one-on-ones with people where, where, you know, some just feel like they have to always be, you know, every six months, every year getting that new title or else, you know, they're going to become irrelevant. And, uh, you know, in the, in the creative world, at least, when you have those uh, more mid-level, just standard kind of specialist titles like designer, animator, illustrator, that's what you get to do all day for the most part is, is the work, the, what you initially fell in love with. As soon as you become a manager, a director, a lot of times that comes with extra non-creative work like uh, having regular one-on-ones with people and hearing, you know, their desires or their frustrations or, or how hard it is to work with this person or that person. And then trying to rationalize yourself and your team to higher ups can quickly become overwhelming. So I try to tell people as early as possible, like, make sure you know what you're getting into, first of all, because if you really just love the work and, and, want to get paid to do that there are definitely paths to just showing that you're someone who's coachable and and always learning new things adding new skill sets whether it's in a narrower area like animation or it's broader and you're a generalist and and you enjoy jumping from animation to web design to package design or whatever uh those those kinds of things are other ways to to grow without having to have that title per se, which I may add puts a target on your back in, in a way yeah. um, because you're held to a higher standard. And, and I've seen it not just recently, but in, in several scenarios where you're, you're, I forget the quote, but you're essentially um, promoted to the level of your incompetence. Yeah. So eventually you're going to get promoted to a place where, where you, because you've done a good job, you've been a good individual contributor to where, okay, you've reached your limit and, and, and you may have to, you either leave that company and take a lower job or you go to maybe a smaller business and keep that title. Um, yeah. 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 No. And to your point, um, having the target on your back is one thing for sure that I think a lot of people don't necessarily consider but probably do feel the pressure and that's probably where a lot of imposter syndrome can come in but i one of the best books i've read is creativity inc by edwin or ed catmull uh, from from pixar yeah in that book he's so smart and all the all the experiences are amazing like i've I've marked that thing up almost every page (laughs) just because i've been so impressed by a lot of what he says but one thing he definitely says is that um I mean, you may get the idea that having this certain position or leadership gives you job security Mm -hmm. when it's quite the opposite. And that instead, he felt like there was this, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but I remember he said something along the lines of he basically had to hire some people and he ended up hiring like he, he thought, do I hire somebody that's better than me Yeah. or, or do I keep my. Do I keep, do I hire somebody who's obviously not better than me so that I can always have like that superiority and, well, and, 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 and a little bit of job security. Right. Yeah, right. He, but in the end he decided to hire the people that were better than him mm-hmm. by, by like light years, you know, mm-hmm. and, and because of that, they ended up being so successful and, and to surround yourself with superior people. And so, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in many ways, I think that that's the key, even though you may direct them. And again, more imposter syndrome, probably because you've got all these people that are better than you, but you're also trying to say, hey, I need you to, to, to you know, I, I'm, I'm going to direct you and boss you around in a way, but not in a way like be a team. And I think that that's the best leaders, the ones that are kind of like, yeah, you know, I, I depend on you and, and together we help each other, you know? Yeah. But, yeah, that's, I mean, that's been the story of my life for sure yeah. <laughs> is because of my desire to learn lots of different 
areas. Um, there are definitely people that are better than me in one area for sure. And, and like yourself in animation. And so it's so nice to be able to know enough to be able to talk with you and, and hold my own. But at the same time, I know if I want this to come out buttery smooth and, and, uh, super nice, you know, Trevor's my guy and same thing with, with other areas of design and, and creativity. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It's definitely key for any anyone who's hiring out there. Hire the per, the people that you're afraid of, <laughs> because that's yeah. that's gonna in the end reflect the best on you. If you're someone who is uh, you know a team player and, and coachable and uh, and and realizing that I think what happens just to get back to the imposter syndrome thing is people think that they're alone and they're the only ones feeling like this a lot, a lot of the times. And mm -hmm. so they'll either try to hide it and, and cover things up. And then it's, it's clear that, you know, that, that person doesn't know something, but, but someone who is open with like, Oh, thank you for showing me that or, or willing to learn from those who are more junior, you know, maybe they're younger than you just out of college and, and you have more experience, but, but we're all learning from each other and you see growth in, in everyone all the time. I think that's one of the best ways to avoid imposter syndrome is, is just to admit that, that you're going through it and, and also realize that others are going through it, but then be the one who's willing to do whatever it takes to, to level up. Uh, as yeah. Said, yeah. Yeah. And leveling up, I was going to say it helps because um, even in, even in my, my time, working at different places, but more specifically where I have been working and valued the most recently. You know, there were times where I, I, I kind of joined a place where animation was animation was uh, kind of the key, kind of people really wanted the animation. But then quickly, leadership kind of changed around. And then the new leadership really just wanted video and wanted less animation. You know, and so I had to put on a new hat. I had to kind of start learning a little bit of some video and some video production. And I, I knew very little, you know, considering I touched it a little bit in college and a few things, but, no. but it wasn't, it wasn't like my degree. It wasn't my direction. It wasn't my focus. And by no way, in no means, am I a perfect, a per, you know, I'm more of a Jack of, of the trade than, than a pro. I would never, I'd sooner hire other people that know more than me, but, but no, what was great was, I loved being able to put on multiple hats and, and become kind of a Swiss army knife and gain new skills. Um, that went back to, like you said, avoiding creative burnout. Um, yeah. It goes back to a valued asset on, on a team. So um, with that, it's, it's kind of like I had one kind of one final question and that was how do you, and, and, and I know that I kind of said with like being a Swiss army knife and stuff, but you know, some people can view that very bad. So, you know, is it, it's not so much a question of what is better, being a renaissance man, a jack of all trades, or mm -hmm. being a specialist, the surgical surgeon tool that just in a team or, or how, do you, how do you become a valued team member on whatever team you are, wherever you're at, consider <laughs> pandemic, consider in-house, consider, you know, whatever work style you are. How do you just create without dying so you can create it? <laughs> <laughs> Great. No, nice transition. Thank you. <laughs> and nice uh, podcast name drop. Yeah, no, becoming that valued asset, remaining that valued asset, um, wherever you're at, in my experience, uh, comes down to one main thing, and that's being dependable. And so it's kind of like going back to the basics of what's important at any job. And that's do what you say and say what you do, essentially. Like if, if the expectation is that you, you show up on time every day, you know, be the first one there if you can. And then if the expectation is that, you know, you need to keep all of these stakeholders in the loop uh, rather than just being a, a silo. I mean, find ways to over communicate and, and ensure that there's 
a good paper trail of, of what's going on. Um, cause you know, boils down to with those who you're working for your boss, your clients, other stakeholders, it's all about making their jobs as easy as possible. Uh, so if they are used to going to Reich, for example, to find answers on uh, a specific project and they go there and the answers aren't there in the comments or something, then they have to go hunt down that person through Slack or email mm -hmm. or physically. And we could unpack a little more as to like what you're saying, you know, dependability is number one. Yeah. Do what, do what you say, say what you do. So um, by doing what you say, so if I, if correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm like committing to certain deadlines or certain commitment, or I say, you know, yes, this will be done by that time, but I, I don't deliver, then, you know, I'm probably starting to be less dependable or be less trusted. Whereas, you know, if I'm, I, I don't hide, I don't like under promise and over deliver as much yeah. as I probably should, because I've, <laughs> I've heard like, that's a great thing to do if you're a freelancer or that's yeah. a great thing to, you know, um, I'm always kind of the guy that's like, yeah, you know, I can lift this car and I'll just not to not to be sure. proud or boastful. It's like, yeah, I'll I'll get this done by this time. But then there's definitely times where I'm like, oh, my gosh, I bit off more than I can. What, do. what did I just commit to or whatever? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But but it's 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 nice to know that dependability is number one. Um, yeah. And I think I think you're you're right on it, though, too, because uh, being dependable doesn't necessarily mean that you know, you're always going to stick to that first committed on deliverable or, or deadline. It may be that, um, you know, based on the information you had yesterday, yeah, I, I would have delivered something today. But then in between that time frame, we got more information like, oh, you didn't want a, a 10 second video, you wanted a 10 minute video. Okay, well, that's a much bigger project. And so it's just about quickly communicating that um, to those yeah. stakeholders like, okay, um, it was made clear that this is happening. You know, I can still deliver, you know, X today, but as far as a, a first cut, it's something that's, you know, it's, it's, that's where that communication comes in. And then we're not all, we're, we're not always going to be perfect. You know, we're going to, we're going to miss a deadline here or there, or we're, but yeah rather than that's where that's where your team comes in and like you said um i like that you say make it make your job easier not harder in a way of as a team player um and don't expect you to always come up with the answers but to also kind of come with the creative thoughts of of uh of doing it because because often you know like i do think that a lot of people can get in the mindset of well we almost, I think we might even treat our, our bosses and our directors and our managers like clients in the sense of, well, tell me what you want and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make it for you versus let me, sh let me give you an idea that I've had, you know, or let me yeah. tell you, let me, let me, I came, I came up with a, so three different solutions. You can choose A, B or C, yeah. you know, um, and, and, and start a conversation where it can kind of go from there because I think that that's definitely vital. Uh, to always go into every meeting or every situation and say, hey, I had extra time to noodle on this and here's some thoughts and you may trash them, but come to the table with, I, I've always enjoyed, I, I'm going to make this more of, whenever I've been invited to like a, a party or you know, a neighbor has invited me over for dinner. One time I, I invited somebody else over for dinner and they came and they brought me a gift. And yeah. I was like, well, what? Like, <laughs> holy cow, what are you doing bringing a gift? Yeah. You know, a lot. And, and this was a complete new, like we just moved into a new area and this neighbor just brought a gift. And it was like my first time meeting them. And I thought, you weren't supposed to bring anything. We invited you, you know. Yeah. But, but I remember how much that impacted me. And then I kind of thought, okay, it, like it impacted me so much that I thought, if I do that with everything, I think I'll be likable. People will like me. <laughs> and not to like, not to like score brownie points. Right. No, it's <laughs> but it's like, I yeah. think you said dependable is num number one, but I would also say up there in like the top three would be, are you likable? Like, are you, 
humble, you know, in that sense that people, you're not the one that's always like the brown noser or the, or, you know, that's always just trying to agree with the director or you're, you're the one that's like making all the jokes and because you're the popular one, you're the one that's going to always stick around. It's more, you know, you could, you, there could be those kind of people everywhere too, but dependable, likable, those kind of things, I think are key for sure. Yeah, no, you nailed it. I, I think that's excellent. You may See, not I'm, need I'm humble enough to to say that, you know, I can I can learn from Trevor and Trevor just dropped some awesome knowledge in here and I <laughs> and I was caught off guard. <laughs> but no, there seriously, like uh this has been awesome. Yeah. Chat with you. I hope uh I hope you'll join me again and, and maybe make this a, a regular thing. Absolutely and awesome. Awesome. All right. So let me know what you think of this episode. Do you like learning about the origin story of working creative professionals? Do you want more of this? Reach out on the social sphere. I'm most active on Instagram, uh, create underscore or underscore die. Also my personal Instagram, animated funk. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Just look up Ike Allred. Follow me and feel free to slide right on into those DMs and let me know if, uh, if you want more of this. Also, don't forget that the best thing you can do to help this podcast grow and keep the episodes flowing is tell your friends, your family, your colleagues, and random people you meet at your favorite Chipotle. Keep on creating, my friends. Until next time, this is your shorty short wearing, mustache sporting, Ferrari driving, Island PI, Ike Magnum. I mean, Allred, signing off. Create or die. <laughs>